All right, hello everybody and welcome back. Today we'll be reviewing the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. We finished male reproductive system last week, if you remember. We went through all the structures of the male reproductive system from testes through urethromiatus. We also went through the physiology and the prime physiology that we reviewed was the creation of sperm and how a man ejaculates sperm. So that would be a good little review for you to go back and review all that material. Okay, we're gonna be doing anatomy of the female reproductive system first. I'm gonna zero in on the PowerPoints and talk you through the structures just like I did with male. Let's take a look at the next slide. And once again, this is in your notes. If you can't see this very well, please open up your book. I know that the print for pictures is pretty small in the notes that I provide for you. So go ahead and pause the tape and get your book out so you can see these pictures. Now, let's start at the ovary, okay? The ovary is gonna release eggs, which will travel through the fallopian tube down into the uterus. If they are fertilized and become what's called an ovum, they will be implanted into the uterus in a normal pregnancy. And if the oocyte or the egg is not fertilized, it will leave during menses, okay, through the vagina. So that's the basic overall gist. Now these structures are held in place in the um, pelvic basin with a couple of different ligaments. You can see on the left, broad ligaments. There are three of them. They all begin with M-E-S-O, meso. Mesosalpinx, mesoovarium, and mesometrium. If you can imagine those structures being encased with a layer of saran wrap. So if I take saran wrap and I wrap it up the front of the uterus, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries, and around the back, so there's one layer on the front and the back, and then I hold that saran wrap on both sides, and I'm holding the uterus and the fallopian tubes and the ovaries in place. That's exactly what that broad ligament would look like. So it's actually a layer of serous membranes that we've talked about several times, encasing the, those structures, and then being held to the abdominal walls very strongly to help to hold that in place. We really wanna keep the uterus in a specific position to make it the best position possible for a woman to get pregnant, okay? So those ligaments help to hold that in place. You can see above that there are ovarian blood vessels supplying obviously blood supply and taking <clears throat> any waste blood away. There's a ligament of the ovary that holds it to the abdominal wall. The fallopian tube, also known as uterine tube, there are three parts of that. If you look at the right side of the screen, there's the infundibulum, that's the opening in which an egg will enter from the ovary. There's the ampulla, which is that little elbow shape you can see above it. And then there's the isthmus, which is the part closest to the uterus. Okay, those are all the uterine tubes, <clears throat> parts of the uterine tubes. Now, in addition, there's also what are called fimbriae. And those fimbriae are just like little fingers, and they sit right on the ovary and simply wait for an oocyte to be released. And when it is, they create kind of like a stroking motion to help sort of gather up that egg. So then it can lead down and through that fallopian tube, okay? So let's go back to um, the top of the uterus. You see the rounded top portion is the fundus of the uterus. Fundus is gonna be important clinically. As a woman moves through her pregnancy, the fundus should be moving upwards as the baby grows. It's called the fundal measurement. If that fundal measurement is not progressing as quickly as it should be, um, it could mean that the baby is not growing as much as the baby should be. Okay, so fundus is the rounded top part. Looking at the middle left, you can see body of the uterus, you can see the ureters passing through there, uterine blood vessels, um, isthmus, we're not gonna talk about that with the uterus, we're gonna talk about with uh, fallopian tubes. 
Um, lateral cerv uh, cervix. Let's talk about the cervix. Okay, so the cervix is going to be the lower um, third to fourth of the uterus. <clears throat> you can see the rounded tip, the opening in that rounded tip is called the external os, OS, and there is an internal os. And you can see that's about an inch thick. And the cervix is going to be the area that, excuse me, will start to thin and dilate as a woman moves through labor, okay? You can see how thick it is there, about an inch, I would say. What happens during labor is that needs to thin, really, 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 really thin until the baby can pass through that opening and the canal, or I should say the thickness of the cervix, thins out enough that it's easily passed by. So that has a ways to go, doesn't it? If you could imagine that, the baby pushing down on that, thinning it out, <clears throat> and dilating the cervical canal. Okay. Walls of the uterus, you can see there are three layers. So that entire wall has three layers to it. Probably the one that most people have heard of is the endometrium. The endometrium we're familiar with because you've probably heard of endometriosis, which is going to be an inflammation um, and also an overproduction of that internal lining of the uterus. That can spread up through the fallopian tubes, out of the fallopian tubes, onto the ovaries, into the abdominal cavity, all the way up into the liver, okay? Not into, onto the surface of the liver. Okay, so endometriosis is kind of a nasty little disease. And in addition to the inflammation, that excess endometrial tissue can scar. So it can leave all sorts of scar tissue in the reproductive organs and also in the abdominal cavity. The round ligament of the uterus. The round ligament of the uterus helps to hold the uterus in place. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? All right, we've gone through those structures. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, if you look at this slide, you could see the sacrum is on the left side of the picture. So this patient's facing to the right of the screen. And this is a great picture to see the relationship of the rectum to the uterus to the bladder. You can see why, now look at the uterus hanging right over the bladder. You see why once a woman becomes pregnant, she has to go to the bathroom several times a day. It's simple pressure. You see the uterus as it grows, it's gonna to start to push on the bladder and it gets harder to hold urine because the bladder is getting pushed on, that space is decreased. You see the opening of the vagina, okay? And you could see how the cervix dips down into the upper part of the vagina. And there's two recesses, there's a posterior and an anterior fornix. Okay, so take a look at those. Those are gonna be important, we'll talk about those in the next slide or two. Okay, posterior and anterior fornix. You can see the body of the uterus and the fundus, once again, at the top. All the different parts of the uterine tube or the fallopian tube and the ovary, okay? The round ligament that we talked about, you can see the round ligament in the back there. You could see how it's attached to the uterus and it pulls the uterus forward, okay? Urinary bladder mons pubis this is the rounded fat pad over the pubic symphysis. Urethra, we know what that is. That's going to leave the bladder. Okay, clitoris is going to be in the anterior portion. Labia majora and minora are going to be the lips at the opening of the reproductive and urinary organs for a female. Okay, this is also a good picture to look at the urogenital diaphragm, lower left. Um, half of the page. Euro the, the name is, I'm sorry, not the picture. You can see the urogenital diaphragm is a little basket. It's just like the diaphragm underneath the lungs, okay? The respiratory diaf diaf diaphragm. Except this one is rounded down, so it's like a U shape almost. And what it does is it helps to cushion and hold up all of those pelvic organs helps to support them. You could see the bladder and the uterus over time in a female as she has um, children, if she's very active, the uterus and the bladder can actually start to drop and that urogenital diaphragm will 
fight that dropping and help to hold them in place, okay? The ovaries. So what happens in the ovaries, I'm gonna leave it once again close up so you can see these pictures. An oocyte is another word for an egg. And what happens is a woman is born pretty much with all the eggs that she will have her entire life. Through her menstrual cycles, what will happen, and through ovulation, I should say too, what will happen is one of those resting immature eggs will be kicked into action. And it will be selected to develop into a mature egg to be ovulated and hopefully um, meet up with a sperm and make a baby. So the steps from an immature egg to a mature egg are primordial, primary, secondary, and vesicular or graphene follicle. Now don't forget follicle is just another word for an egg or a sperm, okay? Now the way that they look different is you could look at the picture, and once again, this is why I'm keeping the picture close. Primordial follicle, if you take a look for that, the left side of the ovary, and you can see all of these eggs are around the cortex or the outer rim of the ovary. The primordial follicle has one layer of squamous cells. <clears throat> it looks really immature. Once you see all of the eggs, and we'll look at these in lab as well. Once you see all of these eggs and how they develop, primordial follicle is very immature looking. It has one layer of squamous cells around it. Excuse me. Primary follicle has what are called <clears throat> one or more layers of granulosa cells. What those look like is cuboidal or columnar cells surrounding the oocyte or the follicle. A secondary follicle. What happens with a secondary follicle is those cuboidal cells keep layering. So instead of one or more layers or one or two layers, it's going to have several, you know, five to ten layers of granular or cuboidal shaped cells. But also with a secondary follicle, something called an antrum appears. And the antrum, if you look at the picture of the secondary follicle, the antrum actually has a little bit of a fluid-filled pouch starting to surround the egg. Now, vesicular graphene follicle, the difference between that and secondary follicle is very minimal, okay? They're gonna be very similar. What is different is the antrum in a vesicular or graphene follicle makes a nice big U-shape that's completely filling um, the space around the oocyte, okay? And what it looks like is it looks like the egg or the oocyte is now on like a stalk of cells sticking out from the side there, okay? That vesicular graphene follicle is ready to ovulate that egg, and you could see it comes out of the ovary at that point. The fimbriae, or those fingers, are just waiting for the egg, and they help guide it into the fallopian tube to go through the tube. If a sperm meets up with the tube, uh, I'm sorry, if a sperm meets up with the egg in the tube, conception will happen. And then that ovum or that fertilized egg will move down the tube and implant into the uterus, okay? Now, after, so that's not the end of the story. There's one more step. You could see after the egg is ovulated, there's gonna be a space left, okay? That space or that um, little area of inflammation is called the corpus luteum, okay? The corpus luteum will actually stay viable and release progesterone until the body decides it's pregnant or not, okay? So progesterone is gonna be released. Um, if a woman moves in her into her menstrual cycle, it'll stop releasing progesterone, and the corpus luteum will actually turn into scar tissue, okay, called the corpus albicans. So if a woman gets pregnant, though, it's really important to understand this. The corpus luteum is going to secrete progesterone. And progesterone will help maintain the viability of her pregnancy, okay? If she doesn't have the appropriate levels of progesterone, she actually may lose the baby, okay? And that's one of the problems that some women have with fertility, okay? Or infertility, I should say, okay? So good cycle to know. I would review that a couple of times. Ectopic pregnancy. 
So we talked about fertilization happening in the fallopian tubes and in a normal pregnancy, the ovum or the fertilized egg should move down the tube and into the upper third or upper half of the uterus and implant in the wall of the uterus, excuse me. <clears throat> in some women, especially if there's scar tissue in the fallopian tubes, and I'll tell you why that happens in a few slides, what can happen is you can see the uterus to the side, you can see the E represents an ectopic pregnancy. What happens is the ovum starts to develop in the fallopian tube and it starts to, it does it start to, attaches to the wall of the fallopian tube and it starts to develop. This is not going to be a viable pregnancy, this ectopic pregnancy. What can happen is the fallopian tube can rupture and the woman can bleed and hemorrhage and obviously the baby would not um, live, sadly to say, okay? So ectopic pregnancy. What can cause this ectopic pregnancy is pelvic inflammatory disease, okay? When bacteria, in most often this is going to be from an STD, a sexually transmitted disease, chlamydia, gonorrhea are two that can cause this. If they are left untreated, and that inflammation spreads upwards, it can go through the uterus, through the fallopian tubes. Now the thing to keep in mind is the fallopian tube at its smallest diameter on the inside, the lumen, the opening, is actually just as wide as a human hair. So any obstruction in that tube can prevent that ovum or fertilized egg from coming down the tube and implanting into the uterus. So pelvic inflammatory disease is a disease that causes inflammation. Inflammation as it's healing, actually one of the byproducts of inflammation is gonna be the deposition of scar tissue. So within that tube system and within the uterus, a woman with pelvic inflammatory disease, once it heals, can actually get <clears throat> Um, scar tissue deposited that can interfere with the ovum traveling down the tube and implanting on the uterus. Okay, so this is a very important thing that we want to treat as quickly as we know someone has it. Pretty obvious signs, right? Lower abdominal pain, fever, rapid pulse, chills, back pain, pain during sex, um, and vaginal discharge is going to be one of the most obvious things that will show, okay, with a patient. The tilting of the uterus. Now we looked at this picture, let me back up a little bit here. Okay, we looked at this picture here. The uterus, you can see, should tilt forward. Okay, that's called an antiverted uterus. Now what happens is the mesometrium, remember we talked about the mesometrium, that saran wrap that encases the uterus, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries and helps to hold the uterus forward, okay? If you don't understand that, come see me and I'll, I'll explain it to you. And the round ligaments are going to be that ligament that moves forward down. And the round ligament actually goes through the inguinal canal and into the labia majora. Okay, Both of those help to hold the uterus tilted forward, Okay, the top tilted forward. Now, what can happen is people can be born with a uterus that is tilted back. So you can see the middle picture there. All the patients are facing the right in these pictures. You can see the uterus is tilted backward, okay? It's called retroverted. The bottom picture, you can see retroflexed. So not only is it tilted back, it's tilted back and it's flexed back. The problem with that retroverted and retroflexed uterus is with a tilted or antiverted uterus, when it's tilted forward, that is the most efficient way for a woman to get pregnant, okay? when it's tilted forward. It's going to be the most direct access for sperm to reach into the uterus and out the fallopian tubes, okay, out into the fallopian tubes. When it's tilted back, it's much harder for the sperm to get to the ova or the oocyte, I'm sorry, okay. It's not impossible. It's just harder. Sometimes after women have their first child who have that retroverted uterus, the ligaments loosen up and the uterus can actually tilt a little bit more forward and it's easier to get pregnant again, okay? Now the bottom, the bottom of the uterus, I'm gonna to talk to you about the cervical mucus, um, mucus glands, you could even say, I have mucus and glands. They are gonna to help to provide a temporary barrier 
that are wax and wane through a woman's cycle, okay? So during the phase where a woman does not want to get pregnant or is not able to get pregnant, you actually can build up a little bit of a cervical mucus barrier. That little mucus barrier helps to provide a little protection against bacteria. So bacteria can't get up through that cervical os or opening, okay? During the phase where a woman's ovulating, when the body wants to get pregnant, that cervical mucus will thin and um, basically go away. So it's easier for sperm to get through, okay? So it creates a temporary barrier. What can also happen <clears throat> after a woman is ovulated, <clears throat> excuse me, cervical mucus builds up at that point, okay? Not only does it protect from bacteria getting into the uterus, what it is also doing is protecting a potential baby from infectious agents coming in. Okay, so a woman, let me rephrase that. A woman ovulates, egg is released, that cervical mucus starts to thicken at the opening of the cervix, closing off the opening of the uterus. If there is not a pregnancy, it'll thin again, okay, with menstruation, <clears throat> stay thin until after ovulation and then build up again, okay? And it's very cyclical in a non-pregnant woman. If a woman gets pregnant though, that mucus will actually become what's called the mucus plug. And it'll block off the opening of the uterus so bacteria, once again, can't get in, okay? And creates a, a barrier to protect the baby and the environment for the baby. Pretty cool, okay? So vagina or birth, control, uh, birth canal, not birth control, birth canal, okay, has different layers. That's what adventitia muscularis and mucosa means. So adventitia is going to be um, the connective tissue on the outside, Muscularis is the muscular layer and mucosa is going to be the epithelial layer of the vagina, okay? And that'll be a stratified squamous. Once again, it's open to the environment and needs protection. The fornices are the arch, also known as arches or vaults. I'll call them fornices. I want you to take just a minute and locate those. There's an anterior and a posterior fornix. If you look at the cervix, once again, you might need your book for this. If you look at the cervix, you can see the anterior fornix and you can see the posterior fornix are the recesses that are in the front of or the back of the cervix, okay? The next slide, um, what, what women used to unfortunately do, um, and I'm sure probably happens now, sad, sad enough to say, they used to take coat hangers and they would put them in their vagina and try to scrape out a baby if they were pregnant. Okay. Now you could see if a woman were to put a coat hanger into her vagina, it would shoot back right through that posterior fornix because they didn't understand that little turn, right, with an antiverted uterus. And what would happen is they would take infectious agents from the environment and put them through that posterior fornix and right into the bottom of the abdominal cavity, right? Because the abdominal cavity lays right above the uterus. And if you do that, you're very prone or apt to get peritonitis, okay? Because you're, in, you're introducing foreign bacteria into the abdominal cavity. Very bad idea, okay? Very bad idea for many reasons. Okay, external genitalia. So perineum, we can look at the perineal region um, and there's a couple of important things that I want to talk to you about. Let's go through the structures briefly. You can you could probably figure these out on your own. We talked about the mons pupus being that fat pad um, where hair is, the labia majora are the lips where hair is as well. Labia minorna are the lips where there is no hair in a female. Okay, there's the hood of the clitoris and the clitoris itself, which is the main copulatory organ for females. It's actually equivalent to a male's penis. Okay. It engorges with blood and it decreases just like a male's penis does as well, just to a much smaller extent. The vestibule is the opening um, to the genital area. Obviously, the anus is for defecation. Vaginal orifice, okay, a hymen is intact in women who have not had sex or are not very physically active. Urethra opening. Um, you'll need to know, obviously, when you do catheters. One thing that you may not know about or are familiar with 
is in the back part. I want you to locate those ducks. Okay, there are ducks in the back that um, lead from what are called the vestibular gland. And the reason I want to explain this to you is those can get impacted and infected in a female and can swell up considerably. So that may concern a woman, but it's just a little bit of a bacteria or even just a blockage um, that's not letting those secretions come out of that duct, backs up, can infect or irritate that duct, or not duct, gland, I'm sorry, infect the gland or irritate the gland, it can swell right up, okay? So opening for those ducts in the back part. And the reason that those are there is because the vagina has no glands itself. The glands that help to lubricate the vagina during intercourse are this greater vestibular gland and also the glands from the cervix, okay? The other thing I like to point out is the space between the posterior of the vagina and the anus known as the perineum, okay, that um, little, I wanna say triangular space, not really. The perineum is going to be the area that they will do episiotomies, okay? When a woman gives birth, um, especially if you had humongous babies like I did, you can rip and tear, and you can rip and tear pretty badly. What can happen if they do not do an episiotomy, an episiotomy is just a little incision that they make. Usually, if you could imagine coming from an angle, like it would be pointing down, if you were to imagine a clock, down to like five o'clock or seven o'clock. Okay, so they'd make an incision in that direction, like towards the gluteal region, towards the ischial tuberosities, because there's nothing that can be really damaged in that area. If a woman is allowed to just rip naturally during childbirth, what can happen is she can rip back to or through the anus and up towards the urethral orifice, which I'm sure you can understand nobody would like. Okay, so if you get an episiotomy, and I've heard several stories about this, and it can create an opening between the vagina and either one, either urethral orifice or the anus. Um, so if you get an episiotomy, it'll prevent that. It'll prevent that from happening. Good for all, okay? Mammary glands. Modified sweat glands, okay? If we take a look at this picture, I know I'm keeping everything close, but I feel like there's so many pictures here that it's easier to do it this way. Um, mammary glands are modified sweat glands that are going to produce milk if a woman has had a pregnancy, okay? Now, Prolactin will be the hormone that will create milk. Oxytocin is the hormone that creates a letdown reflex. So let's talk about that. If we look at the different tissues in the breast, you can see that there are lactiferous um, ducts. There's a lactiferous sinus. Um, and then there are lobules, okay? So milk will be created in the lobules and stored there until a woman is ready to breastfeed. And then milk will, through oxytocin, be let down into those lactiferous sinuses, okay? So milk is right at the nipple, ready to be released to the child, okay? So that's the basics of the duct system. And that is something that I want to talk about really quickly with breast cancer. Okay, so there's two main different types of breast cancer. There's cancer that will happen just in that duct system itself and it stays there. But if it starts to go into the surrounding tissues, you can see there's fat, you can see there's underlying muscle, but also there's underlying lymph nodes. So invasive cancer um, in situ cancer will stay in those duct systems, okay? In situ means it will stay in place in those kind of epithelial duct-like -like systems. Invasive carcinoma of the breast will start to spread out to the muscle, um, to the lymphatics, okay, and start to spread. So you can see how that can happen because there's little subdivisions of those different types of tissues, okay? There's also, you can see suspensory ligaments, which help to hold the breasts up, and the pectoralis major, which is underneath the breast. Here's a microscopic picture of a lactating female. 
Okay? If you take a quick look at them, the one on the left versus the one on the right, you can see the one on the right is full of milk. Okay? All those ducks are full of milk. When a female is not lactating, you can see on the left they shrink down. And that's why a woman's breasts, when she is lactating and breastfeeding, get larger and smaller because they'll fill with milk and then they will shrink and back and forth. Okay. Breast cancer, um, different ways to diagnose it. For the most part, for the most common part, people are going to get mammographies. Mammographies is an x-ray that's used to visualize the breast to look for any um, lumps or bumps. Okay. We're also starting to use MRIs, which is kind of cool because they're a little bit more sensitive than mammography, but it's also cool because don't forget, mammographies are x-rays. So you are shooting x-rays through the breast tissue, okay? Granted, it's minimal, minimal amount, but MRIs don't, so that's pretty neat to be able to use that option. MRIs are very sensitive um, as well, and I think that's sort of one of the controversies is that they're so sensitive that they may label something as being cancerous when it's not, okay? Or it may be harder to detect it. Now, treatment for breast cancer. A lumpectomy would first be the first step, obviously. And lumpectomy would be removal of the lump itself that's cancerous, and the rest of the breast would stay intact. And this is mostly what's done these days because we tend to find it more um, earlier and we tend to be a little bit more conservative, okay? Simple mastectomy would take the breast itself. Radical mastectomy, which is what they used to do, you know, way back, um, 40s and 50s. Radical mastectomy will remove the breast, the underlying tissues, and surrounding lymph nodes. So it's pretty invasive, okay? It's pretty invasive. Okay, I'm going to take a break, reset the videotape, and um, then we'll start with the second part, okay? Get a cup of coffee. See you in a minute.